Okay, hello everyone and welcome back after our summer break to our ninth online workshop about kidney organoids. For those of you who don't know me, I am Susie Gear. Allport syndrome impacts me and many members of my family. I'm also chief executive of Allport UK and the all important mic was passed on to me by Patrick Walker, the young Allport patient who volunteered for Allport UK during lockdown and helped to set up and moderate the first eight workshops. I wish I had the real mic, but it's now in London with Patrick who starts his course in broadcast journalism this week. To show our appreciation to Patrick for all that he did moderating the workshops during lockdown, please write any comments or thoughts during this workshop for us to pass on to Patrick in the chat function. We also want to thank another member of our lockdown production team, Harriet Carter, who is also back at work in a school, but is kindly continuing to work part time for us. And welcome to Alice Cooper, a volunteer who recently joined the team who will support Harriet with the online workshops going forward. And on to our speakers. Today we have three presenters from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to Melissa and her team who are developing approaches for directing the differentiation of human pluripotent stem cells to human kidney organoids. They are applying this knowledge to disease modeling, drug screening, cell therapy, and tissue engineering. And the work has exciting implications for Allport syndrome, which we will hear about later. We are very privileged that Professor Neil Turner is with us again today from Scotland as our scientific moderator, and who will help me put the questions to our guests. Neil is Prof Professor of Nephrology at the University of Edinburgh. Also, welcome back to Archie Walker, one of our young volunteers who will help with the production of this webinar today. So do message Archie or Alice using the chat function if you have any issues. Right, that's enough from me. I think it's about time I hand over to Melissa. Melissa, would you mind sharing your screen and taking us away? Thank you, Susie, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'll just share my screen now. Um, now, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it beautifully, thanks. Excellent, so thank you very much and thanks for attending. I've been looking at the attendees and I know names there, so hello to Richard and Louise and uh, Christophos and Veronica. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is uh, making human kidney tissue from stem cells. Uh, and we make these structures we call kidney organoids. So let's start off with the kidney. I think most of the audience understands uh, what your kidneys do uh, and why we need kidneys. And what's really amazing about these very complex uh, organs is that inside each human kidney, there's about 1 million of these very beautiful epithelial structures called nephrons, which are the filters. So each uh, nephron has a glomerulus, which has a capillary loop in it that is gonna filter that blood. And then the urine is gonna pass down through the proximal tubule loop of Henle into the distal tubule and be uh, concentrated and have its uh, uh, toxins removed from it before it exits the kidney uh, through the collecting ducts and down the ureter into the bladder. What's critical to know as a developmental biologist is that all of those 1 million nephrons in each of your kidneys actually formed before you were born. So the kidney is completely formed during uh, embryonic development. And that's a bit of a problem for us in that uh, if, if you lose or damage nephrons uh, as uh, an, a postnatal person, post birth, uh, then you can't make new nephrons. So I've spent really many years uh, looking at how nephrons actually form, how they arise, how they uh, start as a ball of cells and then elongate and unwind to form these very beautiful structures, how the blood vessels grow into one end to form the filtration. And we'll hear a lot about the glomerulus, particularly as it affects Alpert syndrome patients uh, and all the genes that are involved in that process and the growth factors that signal that process. 
So I guess the key question we wanted to answer, having done a lot of work into how a nephron forms, was can you actually recreate kidney tissue by recreating development? If we fully understand how the nephrons form, can we actually do that all over again to recreate kidney tissue? Now, certainly when I was a university student, this would have just been complete fiction. Uh, and it really is the uh, breakthrough Nobel Prize winning work of, of this scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, who showed that you could take any adult cell, and often we use skin fibroblasts or white blood cells, and what we call reprogram those cells back to an induced pluripotent state. So that's an IPS state. So what's pluripotency? Pluripotency is a state in which the cell has an ability to turn into any other cell. It's the most plastic state a cell can be in. And at the very beginning of development in the embryo, these cells are pluripotent and able to turn into anything. What we have now is an adult cell that's been convinced to go back to that pluripotent state. So it's not an embryonic cell, it's an adult cell that we can then use in the laboratory to try and recreate the tissue that we're interested in. So if we wanted to make a pancreas, we would be taking the pluripotent cells and encouraging them to make a choice to become pancreas. Or if we're interested in heart muscle, to make a choice to become heart muscle. Uh, and in our case, we wanted to know if pluripotent stem cells could be convinced to make uh, recreate uh, kidney tissue in the laboratory. And to cut a long story short, and this really was a, a long story, uh, we published a recipe in 2015 that essentially walks pluripotent stem cells uh, from human cells uh, stepwise through a lot of decision-making steps that would choose a, direct, a path towards kidney rather than heart or liver or gut or brain or any other type of tissue. And we know this based on our understanding of, of embryology. So what starts as a culture of plastic pluripotent cells able to turn into anything but not turned into anything uh, at the end of about a 25 day period we have these very complex structures which we call kidney organoids or kidney in a dish that are now 15 to 20 different cell types but not just a mixture of cells they're actually in a shape uh, that gives them uh, an identity as a kidney tissue so it's a model of the human kidney so this actually uh, is a, a kidney organoid uh, when we've finished with a, about three weeks of differentiation. And you can see that's not one cell type. This is a structure that's a couple of millimeters in diameter. It's a piece of tissue now that is comprised of all of these little nephrons. Here's a glomerulus, proximal tubule, distal tubule, and these are all connected together by this epithelium uh, that holds all the nephrons together. So just to show you that, the glomerulus here is stained in white, the proximal tubule in blue, uh, the distal tubule in green, and then the connecting epithelium in, in uh, orange. Not only are these really very complex tissues where you can see all of these nephrons are connected together as they would be in the developing tissue uh, and are forming the glomerulus at one end and connecting together at the other end. But around these structures, there are interstitial cells holding the tissue together, and there are also blood vessels. These are the um, endothelial cells of the blood vessels forming in the organoid here, and this is a low resolution where all of these red structures is a vasculature that's forming. Uh, and looking at the organoid as a whole, in green, you can see all the blood vessels running out through uh, the forming nephrons. Uh, so this is really a very complicated structure uh, and importantly, they also have these uh, really very nicely patterned glomeruli, which is the filtration unit of the kidney. So uh, while these look really like what we would uh, think of as kidney, we really wanted to ask, um, are we kidding ourselves? And so we actually looked at all of the genes that were on in this tissue and we compared the genes that were on in this tissue with the genes that were on in a whole series of tissues from human fetuses and asked, what is this most like? And what this is showing you is that these tissues are most like kidney. And so we can conclude that a human kidney model can be generated from these pluripotent stem cells. 
and that these structures that we call kidney organoids have many different cell types that are arranging themselves in a recognizable way as kidney tissue. They have nephrons, stroma and vasculature and the genes they're expressing very closely match what we would expect to happen during human fetal kidney uh, development. So uh, what are we going to do with kidney organoids? And I think it's quite important to put this out there as what are the possible applications of this technology. Uh, because you can make a kidney organoid from a pluripotent stem cell line, this means that you can make a kidney organoid from any, any, any individual. And by that, that also includes any patient. It's quite easy to make a pluripotent stem cell line from any patient. And that means that we can make a copy of their kidney tissue without actually taking any kidney from them. Because it's now very possible in the laboratory to edit the genome of cells, we can also create mutant cells to actually uh, disrupt particular genes and have a look at what effect that has on kidney development. And we can even use gene editing, as you'll hear about from Tom and Ord, to correct mutations in genes that we know are defective in, um, in patients. So with these uh, kidney organoids, whether they're made from mutant cell lines, from patient cell lines, or from corrected cell lines, we can use to have a look at everything from better understanding human developmental biology, which we really haven't been able to look at, right through to screening uh, drugs, drug discovery, drug testing, modeling human kidney diseases to better understand them, using cells we make in the dish potentially for therapy and ultimately potentially making a kidney tissue for patient treatment. So I've got a circle here around disease modeling and most of what we'll talk about tonight is disease modeling. Uh, and uh, I guess many people would consider kidney disease as a condition that affects elderly people prim primarily, but uh, one in 15,000 children has an inherited form of kidney disease. And while we know more than 400 genes in which you can get a mutation that gives you a kidney disease, about half of the patients that present with uh, inherited kidney disease will get a diagnosis and the other half will not. So there's still many causes for these inherited kidney diseases we don't understand. The issue is that for those with a diagnosis, we still don't understand the cause of the disease in many instances. And we don't have treatments other than those treatments that have been available for more than 50 years now. That is transplantation or dialysis. So there really is a great need for improved disease models and uh, drug screening platforms. So what are our options? So animal models have been used for a long time to model a variety of diseases, in, including kidney disease, but animals are animals, they're not human. This is quite expensive, it's low throughput, and even when an animal has a copy of the same gene, a mutation in the animal may not give the same disease as in a human. We also have uh, been able to isolate cells in the, in the case of kidney from biopsies and grow them in the laboratory, but these are generally uh, a cell type grown uh, as a flat layer in a dish that is nothing like uh, the original tissue. And so often that doesn't give us a great deal of information. So we really need better models. So it's, uh, there are a whole variety of parts of the nephron that can be affected by genetic disease. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight here the glomerulus. And of course, this is the uh, target for mutations in collagen 4A, 3, 4 and 5, which causes Orpitz syndrome. But there are also particular mutations that give you proximal tubular disease, disease that affects the loop of Henle or the distal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct. Uh, and so for us to model any of these diseases well, we have to have a good model of that particular nephron segment in our kidney organoid. So I'm going to start uh, with the glomerulus and we do have very beautiful glomeruli uh, that have these uh, unique cells called podocytes that have these tight foot processes that interdigitate that form a very tight filtration barrier that prevents or should prevent the protein from going through into the urine and keep it in the blood. And the glomeruli you'll see a bit more of when Ord talks, uh, but they're really quite uh, similar to adult uh, human glomeruli. So I'm not going to talk any more about disease modelling because Tom and Ord will. I'm going to talk very briefly about can we build a human kidney for replacing renal function. 
Uh, and the simple answer is no, uh, but I'm going to talk about it because a lot of people ask about this. And I'd say right up front that our major problem at the moment is uh, scale. We have problems of scale, structure and function, but if we just look at scale, what I mean is, as, as you recall, a human kidney has a million nephrons. Uh, our organoids like the one I just showed you have about 100 nephrons. So we're really uh, a long way below the number of nephrons you would need to make a difference. Even a mouse has 16,000. So are there ways that we can tackle this challenge? So in fact, in our laboratory, we've started to make our kidney organoids using uh, 3D cellular bioprinting. So this robot is actually making a, a panel of nine organoids. And in the time that I talk, it will finish these nine. And that doing that by hand is, is a much slower process doing it with a robot. We can produce large numbers of very identical organoids very rapidly. And this is great. Uh, we hope it will really facilitate us in our ability to, to do drug screening. But cellular bioprinting allows us a, a, a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how we print the tissue. And so we've actually been changing the conformation of that tissue and printing antiparallel stripes rather than dots. And now we can scale this up into large sheets or patches of tissue that now have in the order of thousands of nephrons. Uh, and now we're moving towards uh, a, a tissue source that may be um, big enough. So what happens if you transplant these? We have actually tested this and this was in collaboration with our colleagues in the Netherlands at the Leiden University Medical Centre. If we take one of our standard organoids and put it under the renal capsule of an immunocompromised mouse, uh, it will grow and over a couple of weeks will grow substantially. And we can actually image this through the uh, flank of the mouse. And here you can see that the human tissue, which is all marked in red, uh, is next to the mouse kidney and the blood vessels uh, from the mouse kidney have grown in and formed a capillary network in the human glomerulus. So here, this human glomerulus, which we know is human because we've tagged it with blue fluorescent protein, has mouse, run, mouse blood running through it uh, and is beginning to filter. Uh, and in fact, here, what you can see is uh, again in green, mouse blood running through blood vessels that are human derived because they're red. Importantly, what that does is it improves this structure, the glomerular basement membrane of the glomerulus substantially. And so that's uh, nice early evidence that uh, transplantation allows blood vessel formation and improvement of maturation. So I'm actually gonna stop there and conclude that uh, we can make a model of the human developing kidney that's quite accurate from these induced pluripotent stem cells that we can use these organoids to model inherited kidney disease, and we hope to therefore screen for new treatments for particular inherited kidney diseases. And uh, ultimately, we may be able to replace kidney function using stem cell derived kidney tissue. So I will stop there other than to introduce uh, Tom uh, Forbes, who's a pediatric nephrologist and a PhD graduate from my laboratory, who's gonna talk about cystic kidney diseases and uh, Dr. Ord Dorison, who's a postdoc in my lab looking at the glomerular diseases. Uh, and I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. I'll stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Um, it was uh, incredible to hear about the progress that you've made since uh, you and I first met in Glasgow in 2017. Um, and oh wow, stunning graphics uh, really brought it alive for me as a, as a patient. Um, and they very clearly explained the exciting things that you're doing. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I, th I suppose this m might be a bit of a, a basic question, um, but it's very much on my mind as a mother uh, with um, boys who have Allport syndrome. Uh, you know, anticipating the opportunity to replace um, tissue in, in the kidney to make it, you know, function more effectively in the future. 
uh, at what stage, I mean, it's, it's very early stage in this process, so it'd be really helpful to understand sort of the time frame that you think, because <laughs> it's always a, t a timing thing, isn't it? Uh, us mothers have got children who are getting older and as their kidney function is declining. But um, yeah. what, what sort of time frame? And also, um, uh, people will also wonder at what um, stage in their kidney function would that sort of therapy need? Need to happen because we all watch our GFRs very closely and things so I'm keen to understand before fibrosis gets too bad perhaps you could tell us a bit about that so I guess I have to be very clear as I said that this is not going to work at this point in time uh, and I have to say I've been uh, I think it's remarkable that we've come this far in the period of time years um, and I think early on, I was really just focused on, are we sure this is a good model? How good is this model? Exactly how developed is it? And I, I you know, perhaps as recently as a year ago, I went, okay, we, we really have to have a go at seeing what we could do long-term, but this is long-term. I mean, as I said, we're gonna have to make lots of tissue with lots of nephrons, but more than that, we're gonna have to show that they can, uh, um, productively filter and have somewhere where we can take the urine away when transplanted into a patient. Uh, we also probably will have to start with the concept of trying this in, in elderly patients. Uh, but I think the key here is to look at what um, options are on the table now. Uh, transplantation, a well-matched transplant is still, I would say, even if we get good at this, gonna be a, a superior option because uh, the kidney itself is perfect. Um, but I believe we realistically, and I hope within my career, um, can reach a point where what we could provide would be better than dialysis, or at least uh, provide a, an improved option for a person waiting for a transplant. Okay. That, that is very exciting um, in terms of the progress. I, I guess the second question too, um, as patient groups, we're being approached by a number of drug companies with potential clinical trials and things. And one of the questions that's always on our mind is, have the drugs been tested sufficiently before they're tried in patients, particularly young patients, because a lot of the Allport patients are you know, in their uh, teens and young adulthood. Um, have any drug companies um, approached you and what sort of work are you doing with the pharmaceutical industry at the moment with these uh, yeah, I think models? The, yeah the drug companies are very interested they're not quite sure how to um, approach it I know a number of them are trying to set their own kidney organoid protocols up and we've helped them where we can but I think you'll hear from Ord and Tom that much faster in terms of potentially doing good for kidney disease will be using these as a model they are a model okay. uh, and if we can start to use these as a way of, as a surrogate, as a way of saying, and what would happen if I added this drug uh, to a person with this disease, then I think we really may be able to start providing uh, options that aren't available now. Um, okay. and, and in some instances, in some types of inherited kidney disease, we may be able to use these to find a drug that's specifically tailored for that. And if you look at the example of cystic fibrosis, Organoid models, a different type of organoid model of the lung, are now being used routinely to ask, will that patient respond to this drug? Okay. Um, and so I really think that's where the potential is, is, is greater. Okay. Great. Well, th thank you very much. I think um, in the interest of time for the moment, I've got more questions, but well, I'll hand over to Neil to ask some more specific scientific questions. Thanks very much. Melissa, I'm always jealous of uh, people who work with organoids because I never got anywhere near any research with such beautiful images. And uh, it is extraordinary, as you say, how things have moved on. Um, and even though it's a long way from transplantation, so much is, is being learned. Um, a bit like the moonshot, you know, and uh, coming up with all sorts of incidental advances. But um, so we're going to hear some about some of those later. Can I just take you a little further? You showed absolutely beautiful pictures of the vascularization at the top end of the nephron. And clearly the other challenge is getting the bottom end 
where all of these little glomeruli to link up and put their urine into something that becomes a ureter, a bottom end. Now, it sounds as if that's quite challenging. Could, could you say a little bit more about that? Yes, well, we're actually learning a lot about normal patterning. Um, so uh, you can actually change the balance of distal to proximal by playing around with your protocol, but we, we don't have a single exiting uh, ureter. We don't even necessarily have um, a, a connection to what we transplant in terms of um, an exit path for the urine. And uh, it's, gonna not, it's not gonna work unless we can work that out. Um, but I'm quite hopeful that uh, we may be able to convince the nephrons we build to plumb themselves into an existing kidney and or build the rest of it. Um, it's now a tissue engineering challenge. Mm -hmm. Just to go back a, a little bit to a little bit earlier in the process, um, Louise Hopkinson is, is, is asking what, what, when you went through this developing this protocol, was it lucky guessing or what was the process that you went through to think what, um, what growth factors to use? Mm. So yeah, lucky guesses, uh, you know, there are billions of different combinations you could try in terms of what growth factors in what combination for how long in what order. Uh, we had to use a framework and we used the framework of the embryo. So we know a lot about the fact that the kidney is a mesodermal organ. We can walk back and say it's intermediate mesoderm. The intermediate mesoderm comes from the posterior primitive streak. The posterior primitive streak comes from gastrulation. And we know a lot about the genes that need to turn on, the, the growth factors that signal. And so we basically tried to go step at a time. And this has been the case in most uh, pluripotent stem cell organoid approaches. So we went pluripotency to posterior primitive streak, posterior primitive streak to intermediate mesoderm. And we knew the flag, the mileposts along the way to say, okay, that worked. And so you then kind of develop your recipe a step at a time. And now that means we can't be sure this is perfect. Uh, and we still do a lot of work asking, what if I change this? What does it do? Um, but at least we have a framework that gives us the structures that we recognise, and um, and now it's a matter of finessing that process. Yeah, and, and, and I guess with the ability to look at the expression profiles of individual cells, maybe you're learning a lot more about that now. Yeah, we are, well, I mean, we're not we have we haven't talked about this today, but we do a lot of single cell analysis, and um, we're developing tools to directly compare one protocol with the next, with the next, with the next, and that that means you can start to get into factorial screening type approaches where you can say exactly what cells are in this diff versus that diff. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Melissa. Susie, I suspect we should flip on, but I think some of these questions about whole kidney may well come back later on. And um, that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And time to get um, Tom presenting. Tom, can you share your screen, please? Certainly. And, uh, and I echo Melissa's thanks for, um, for inviting us to speak uh, today. Can you hear me all right? Yep, can hear you and see your screen beautifully. Good to go. Wonderful. So, um, so as Melissa mentioned, I, I approach this with two sort of interests. I'm a clinician, I'm a paediatric nephrologist, uh, and also um, a scientist working with these organoid models. So uh, I sort of have a, an interest from, from both directions. And tonight I'm going to be presenting, or well, this morning for you, I'm going to be presenting some of our work on uh, modelling tubular diseases with the organoids, as I've highlighted here in red. And whilst I'm not specifically presenting on a disease that has direct relevance to Alport syndrome, my, uh, my hope here is that I'll be able to illustrate some of the basic general principles from our disease modelling projects. Now the two diseases that I'm discussing tonight are both inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern, which is you know, not the case for the, for the bulk of, uh, of uh, Alport syndrome uh, inheritance. So just to recap this mechanism of inheritance, um, a, a patient that suffers from an autosomal recessive disease, and I'll just grab my laser pointer, um, needs to inherit uh, an abnormal copy of that disease gene from each of their parents, who is presumably 
a carrier or must be a carrier and, and may even be affected. Um, and so you, you really must have two abnormal genes to have the disease. If you are luckier enough to have only one copy of the gene that is abnormal, then you won't suffer from the disease, generally speaking. And that's just an important point to get across when you consider the way that we generate our control cell lines, which I'll discuss in a minute. So the first project that we really approached with the kidney organoids examined um, this disease called nephronophthesis and, and Susie, a gold star for your pronunciation uh, in the introduction. Um, this is quite a rare and poorly understood pediatric kidney disease. It has no specific treatment and an inevitable early decline to end-stage renal disease. It's often lumped in with cystic kidney diseases and, and you can see that in the, the first case up here uh, reported in the 50s, there were some larger cysts. But um, cyst development in this condition is quite variable and the more prominent renal biopsy findings are these ragged and dilated tubules with uh, abnormalities of the basement membrane, not dissimilar to that that we see in Alport syndrome of the glomerular basement membrane. And also this fibrosis, this expansion of tissue between the tubules, which often sit back to back with no such um, tissue between them. In terms of the genetics, there are about 50% about of, of cases are genetically diagnosable and there are about 40 different genes that can cause nephronophthesis. And whilst each gene represents a very small number of patients, collectively nephronophthesis represents the most common genetic cause of end-stage renal disease under 30 years of age. So our patient for this project was initially diagnosed with a condition called senior Loken syndrome, which is just an eponymous syndrome that describes the co-occurrence of um, retinitis pigmentosa, a genetic eye disease, and nephronophthesis, which is the genetic kidney disease. Uh, and she underwent um, a trio whole genome sequence, which means that we do the, the, the genomics for both parents and the child and try and cross-reference. Um, potential um, genetic causes. This turned up two variants, which is the new term for mutation in IFT140 and a number of computer generated assessments um, suggested that these were quite damaging uh, variants. Um, and IFT140 hadn't actually been described as a cause for senior Loken syndrome before, but it had been described as a cause of the very closely related Mainzer Saldino syndrome. And all of these syndromes are just described after the people, but named after the people that first described them. And uh, MSS, as, as it's known, is essentially just the eye disease with the kidney disease plus some skeletal features. And this allowed us to go back and re-examine the patient, do some x-rays and essentially redefine her diagnosis. So how did we go about making the stem cells for this project? Well, Sarah Howden, pictured down here, who leads the MCRI gene editing facility, uh, as Melissa said, took some, some skin fibroblasts from our patient and she executed this combined reprogramming and CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing for one of the two IFT140 mutations that our patient suffered from. Uh, the stem cell reprogramming is the, is, the, is the part of the experiment that turns the skin cell into the stem cell and then the CRISPR-Cas9 corrects the gene um, mutation in a separate in a sort of a separate apparatus. And because no biological experiment in science is 100% effective, there are effectively three different fates for any cell that enters this, this sort of combined experiment. Uh, option A is that nothing happens. They're unsuccessfully reprogrammed and they just continue to look like skin cells and we can recognize that under the microscope and ignore those cells. Uh, option B is that the cell does get successfully reprogrammed into a stem cell, but fails <clears throat> to become um, gene corrected. And so you wind up with a stem cell clone here which reflects the patient's genes, not corrected. And then of course, option C is that you get reprogramming and successful gene correction. And this creates a stem cell clone that now functions as a, an internal control for us. And we call it an isogenic control. And the real value in having an isogenic control, which is now the gold standard of the field is, is as follows. If we really crudely depict a patient's DNA as this blue line, you can see that there are multiple idiosyncratic um, you know, genetic variants um, dotted throughout it, uh, which are of, in, in many cases, trivial significance, but often unknown. Traditionally, we would have studied um, this, this DNA against an unrelated control DNA, which would have a different set of idiosyncrasies. Some of them might line up, but most of them will be variable. Importantly, of course, you don't have the patient variant in your control DNA. 
Um, because of the potential confounding factor of these differences, we now take the patient DNA and we have the tools to be able to just correct the little spelling error in the patient's DNA such that none of the other idiosyncrasies that exist in the patient's DNA represent a difference between your diseased uh, arm and your control arm. And this just helps to isolate the patient variant within uh, the experiments that we are performing, which are increasingly and increasingly much higher in their fidelity and granularity, where very small changes in the DNA um, can have larger impacts. So, returning to IFT140, um, what does it do? Well, uh, it's, it's known to cause a disease of the primary cilium. And the primary cilium is this little hair-like cellular antenna, which sticks out of the front of almost every cell in the body. And its main uh, purpose is to sense flow and also chemical signals outside the cell. Uh, essential for its function is are two inbuilt transport systems. So there's one that delivers ciliary components from the base up to the tip, and then another that, that transports some back down from the tip to the base and then recycles them. IFT140 is a critical component of this downward transport system called the retrograde transport system. And when it's deficient, you, you get this holdup of, you know, ciliary people trying to catch the train back to the base. And that, that deforms the, the, cili the cilium and it becomes this sort of baseball shape or club shaped, which has been quite well described. And, and this was a mouse model from um, a, a manuscript that was published out of our institute a few years ago. And it's a mouse limb bud in an IFT140 mutant mouse. You can see the, the, the normal cilium here, long and straight, whereas the abnormal cilium here has this sort of baseball shape. And this is relevant because it's the first thing we went looking for in our organoids. And the, and the primary objective of this particular project was simply to demonstrate that there was evidence of this patient's kidney disease within her organoids, because this had never been established for a patient-derived kidney disease previously. So what we did was we differentiated both lines into kidney organoids in a paired experiment, and then we stained the distal part of the tubule, which is stained here with the green uh, marker, uh, with, a, with a ciliary marker, which is the red. And you can see that we've got those nice um, club-shaped, baseball bat-shaped cilia in the disease line, in the patient line. And when we perform the gene correction, we get this, this nice lengthening, normal straight um, uh, cilium uh, in the gene corrected clone. We also demonstrated, um, consistent with previous literature, that the diseased cilia were slightly shorter than the gene-corrected cilia. So having established that there was some evidence of the disease within the patient's cilia, we wanted to know if we could dissect things further and illuminate some molecular pathways that were potentially contributing to disease, because this is the pathway towards discovering new treatments. And in order to do that, we needed to get the epithelial cells out of the organoid so that we could examine them alone. As, as Melissa presented, our organoids are full of multiple cell types that are all doing different things. And to try and analyze that at a molecular level can, be get, can get quite messy. So in an effort to pull the, um, the epithelial cells out of the organoids, we broke them down with enzymes such that you get um, all of the cells that made up the organoid just floating in, in as single cells in the fluid. And then we uh, throw in some special antibodies which bind to the cells that we want and they're all connected to um, uh, little magnetic beads, such that when you push that fluid through a magnetic field, all of the cells that you want get retained within the magnetic field, and you can then um, elute them when you remove the magnetic field. And with, and with this collection of epithelial cells, we proceeded with, oh, a big pardon, with RNA sequencing. Um, and RNA sequencing is, I think Melissa called it transcriptional profiling. It essentially involves getting machine to count uh, the, the frequency with which uh, every gene in the genome is being expressed. And you can then compare that from one cellular type to another cellular type. So we, of course, compared it between our disease and our gene-corrected control. And a long story short, what we found when we looked into this was that the output seemed to favor cellular processes that were involved in polarity, which essentially involves the cell being able to tell its front from its back. 
obviously any cell in the kidney is going to need to put some proteins at the front side of the cell and some at the back in order to function properly. And what we sensed from our, our transcriptional profiling was that that wasn't working very well in our diseased cells. To validate that, we went back and took the same cells that we were filtering from the organoids and put them into gel. So just a single cell sitting in the middle of a gel and we asked it to grow and make a nice cyst. And what we found, oh, frozen. What we found was that they couldn't do it. So up the top here, we have uh, cysts that have grown over about a week from the, uh, the previous gold standard, which is a mouse um, uh, kidney epithelial cell. And you can see it makes really nice spheres here that have a clearly defined inside and a clearly defined outside. Whereas, and, and in the gene corrected uh, cells, we found the same nice looking spheres that had a well-defined inside and outside, but the patient cells just couldn't do it as often. And we ended up just getting these blobs of cells that had no lumen um, and, and were, were unable to really establish that polarity. So that validated our findings um, for this particular disease. So that was, that was one of our first uh, forays into disease modelling. And uh, I wanted to present just in the, in the last three minutes um, some of our works in progress. Uh, and that uh, is regarding autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. And this is a slightly more common disease that affects one in 10 to 26,000 people, depending on the paper you read. It's much rarer than um, the, the disease you may have heard of called autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which is one of the most common genetic diseases in the world. And unfortunately for babies born with this disease, they're, they're often born without uh, any kidney function and with poorly developed lungs and require dialysis and intubation from birth. And one fifth of them, unfortunately, even with modern intensive care, die of the first couple of months of life. Uh, older children can be born healthy and, and uh, find, uh, experience a slower decline in their kidney and liver function, but often require transplantation before they turn 18. And almost ubiquitous cause of uh, ARPKD is uh, this gene called PKHD1, which makes a protein called fibrocystin, which again is very poorly understood in its function. Again, we're talking about a ciliary disease, but instead of this being a, a disorder of ciliary uh, transport, we're talking about fu the function of proteins on the cell surface of, of, of the cilium. And you can see here fibrocystin, the green protein interacting with the two gene products um, uh, that, that, uh, that are made from the genes that cause ADPKD. And this is thought to have a role in, in calcium entry and flow sensation within the cilium, but ultimately it's, it's largely unknown. The other major difference between autosomal dominant and recessive polycystic kidney disease is that in the dominant adult disease, you get cysts arising from all segments of the nephron, proximal, middle, distal, and collecting duct, and they bud off from the tubule and blow up like balloons. But in ARPKD, we are restricted only to the collecting duct, and we don't see cysts elsewhere in the nephron, and they don't bud off from the tubule. They, they, they remain in, in continuity and communication with the, uh, with the tubule. So in order to model this disease, we really needed to make sure we had a good model of the collecting duct. And again, in work that's been led by Sarah Howden within our lab, um, she's pioneered this approach of isolating the collecting duct cells from the organoids, which are expressing a red fluorescent protein here, purifying them using a similar method uh, from, from the organoids and then plating them, as I suggested earlier, in a matrigel sort of cyst culture. And over time, they develop these sort of branching structures, which is very classic for uh, collecting duct when it's um, cultured from, you know, prim pr from primary kidney. And what we've seen when we use a stem cell line where we've deleted the PKHD1 gene that causes uh, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease from the stem cells is that, that these uh, collecting duct structures form these large cystic structures whereas over the same time the normal wild type line with a normal genomic makeup um, does not and we were able to measure this um, uh, and so this is really exciting because it's a very simple system that we could use to, um, to study novel treatments. So hopefully what I've been able to demonstrate is that we can use organoids to dissect and learn about disease mechanisms. Um, importantly, we can validate genes as being causative of disease, which is really important for patients to be able to access things like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis if they wanna try and, and have children that, that aren't affected by the disease. And finally, what I think is really most exciting 
um, and, and is almost certainly more tractable than, than the use of organoids as a renal replacement therapy is the ability to discover new therapies for some of these genetic diseases that might hopefully make the need for transplantation obsolete. I just want to thank everybody from our, from our lab that contributed to this and I've added a few names of people from outside the lab that have helped as well. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Um, uh, intriguing research and uh, thank you too to I think it was Sarah Howden you referred uh, in your lab it sounds like she's doing some exciting stuff I know there's a usually a host of people who contribute to these amazing uh, projects so thank you to you all um, it, it's really intriguing to hear particularly about the organoids that you use to model other rare renal conditions and the research that you're doing on the different conditions. Um, tell us as all port patients, what we can learn from research into other renal conditions. Tell us about some of the interaction that goes on. Um, so I suppose when one, one of the, uh, the problems with, with studying kidney disease is that the kidney is made up of so many different cell types and um, the, the wide spectrum of, of gen genetic disease that we see in the kidney uh, really depends on which cell type is, uh, is, is deficient or which is dysfunctioning. Um, and so that, that creates a problem for us, or it creates a lot of work for us because uh, each um, each disease requ really requires its, its own optimised model so that you know that the cell type you're studying is the right cell type. And I think the ARPKD project is, um, is a, a classic example of that. And so um, I suppose if you're going to put Melissa's talk together with that question and, and with my work, you would say that we wanted to, um, to optimise our, our processes towards the glomerulus and optimise the process of vascularization of the kidney in order to try and get um, a, a good Alport model, a model that had some blood vessel and some podocyte interacting so that you could, um, so that you could model that disease. And then I suppose on, on a broader level, we need to think about how are we going to set up some of these processes so that we can execute some of this high, high throughput compound screening where you make, serially make, you know, uh, hundreds and thousands of organoids um, so that you can treat each one with a, you know, sometimes with, a, with no idea of which one is going to work with just libraries of medicines in the hope that uh, one of them will look to make a difference. And that might be something that is easily applied um, regardless of the disease you're studying um, using one platform that we, we develop. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm also um, interested, you mentioned at the end that your techniques um, uh, have relevance to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, you know, again, we have families uh, who are thinking about PGD at the moment. Um, and I'm wondering whether that's a reality for today. Uh, can you just tell me a bit more about it and the relevance? So the, so the relevance there is that when, um, when you receive a genetic diagnosis, um, you, you, you get the mutation that, that you, your family carries um, and that comes with like a weighting. So there are some that are very convincing, clearly seen before, reported across multiple families. There's no question that's the cause of your disease. Uh, and that's, that's weighted by a special, it's called the ACMG, the American College of um, Genetic Medicine, have a, um, a, a, a scoring system that, that defines the, how pathogenic that variant is. So if you've got a highly pathogenic variant, you'll be offered PIGD, you'll be able to, you know, um, to, to use that if you, if you please. But for, for patients where the, the, the gene variant is, is a little more equivocal, unfortunately, um, you know, for ethical reasons, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis can't be can't be offered and, and, and until you get to a point where you've got that validation. So that's what the organoids offer is the ability to add the weight behind the variant. Um, and, and as you've seen that we can do that very spe very specifically for that for that spelling error, that, that patient derived variant in the hope that they can then access that technology to be able to have a healthy child. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, right, Neil, I'll hand over to you to ask Tom some questions. Thanks very much. Tom, those are beautiful experiments. And, um, and, and I was, it, it looks like you've got a really uh, good test bed there for showing that the gene does what you think it does. But therefore, you've also got a test bed for showing that correction other than germline correction of the mutation might work. And um, in the Alport arena, for instance, we've had some presentations of 
applying oligonucleotides to the cells that might lead to exon skipping, that might lead to you making, uh, making get, getting by, producing at least some protein, even though you've got a, a splice mutation like the one you described in nephronophysis. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I omitted some of the data because it's incredibly complex to present and I didn't quite have enough time to get to it. But, um, but uh, it, it really depends on, on what the mechanism is for the variant that you're looking at um, as to sort of how you might approach it. Um, and, and I think the important thing to emphasise here is that an, an exon skipping oligonucleotide will work for some patients with Alport syndrome, but not all. And we're increasingly approaching an era where um, we're hoping to be able to employ personalised therapeutic screening and, and technologies such that, you know, in, 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 in an ideal world, um, you would donate your um, blood cells or skin cells, we would make an organoid, we would perform a compound screen for the available treatments and work out which one worked best for you, um, whether that be a gene therapy or, a, um, uh, you know, or, or some, some other form of, of a small molecule. Um, and that's again um, very sort of uh, forward future thinking, but um, that's that's the sort of hope that we have for these technologies. Yeah, yeah, and a really really exciting era we're heading into. Um, there's a couple a couple of questions actually about, about a little bit more about this the the science of the of the disease. Um, uh, and first first from Rachel in Manchester, Rachel Lennon. Um, and Hi, Rachel. He's interested in um, basement membranes, as, as, as I am, and is, is fascinated, as I am, by this tubular basement membrane abnormality in nephronophysis, and, and wonders whether you've got any insights into that. So, yeah, this is, uh, Rachel's referring to a, um, a long-standing conundrum about nephronophthesis as to whether the defect is an epithelial defect or whether it is uh, what we call a stromal defect, so due to the um, a, a defect in the cells that support the, the tissue structure and the basement membrane um, of the interstitium. Um, and there, there are a couple of schools of, of thought there. I think the, the fact that almost all the genes that cause problems with, um, with nephronophthesis are ciliary and, and the primary cilium is really a, a critical, critically important organelle for an epithelial cell. I think, I think the epithelial cell is probably more likely to be um, the defect, but no doubt there's going to be some communication breakdown between stromal cells and epithelial cells that and there's going to be some sort of codependency in, in, in the way the disease manifests. Um, so uh, exactly, we, I, I don't know how to answer um, Rachel's question and I suspect that's why she asked it. Thanks, Rach. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I suspect that there's going to be some some, cro some cellular crosstalk uh, um, that, that leads to those um, those changes in, in, the, um, in the basement membrane and if that was an offer of collaboration, uh, Rachel, then uh, I'll seriously consider it. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably need to find, you know, the next 40 genes uh, involved, <laughs> uh, so that we can get up to um, a slightly higher percentage of patients being diagnosed to, to help with that one. Um, Richard Naylor has got a, a really a nice question uh, for the ARPKD side. Um, uh, why is fibrocystin only leading to cysts in the collecting ducts, whereas these other cellular abnormalities are anywhere? Yeah, that's a really good question because, um, uh, and, and it's likely to be uh, due to um, the specific way that the gene is spliced in certain tissues. And there are some studies in mouse tissues that have found over 20 different, what we call splicing isoforms of that particular gene in the kidney alone, let alone in the rest of the body. Um, so it, it's, it's likely um, that the, the gene is spliced or uh, in a certain way um, that, that makes it, uh, it sort of specific to disease in the collecting duct. Um, the other possibility which is, which is uh, likely is that there is, um, uh, again, a codependency between the, the, uh, the function of PKHD1 and, and various other genes that are expressed in that segment of, of, of the kidney. Again, we don't know. These are the exciting things that we can start to dissect um, by looking at, at, uh, at this, this sort of human cellular-based disease model. Thanks, Tom. I didn't know that about the splicing complexity of fibrocystin, and it almost brings me back to WT1, which I think is where Melissa in Edinburgh did some of her early research, but thanks very much indeed. What a Actually, you know, that, that's exactly where I was. I was in <laughs> working on WT1 in the yeah, 30 years ago. Yeah. 
these are really fascinating strands which have clearly got a long way to go and I think we, we should move on. Thank you very much, Tom, indeed. You're silent. Thank, th thank you very much, Neil. Um, okay, uh, right, uh, we're handing over to Ord. Ord, can you share your screen, please? Sure, no problem. Right. Great, we can see it well. Thank you. you Take it away, it. Ord. Yep. All right, fantastic. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be virtually here today, and thank you so much for inviting us to present our research here. Um, as Tom and Melissa said, I'm going to be focusing uh, my talk on diseases of the glomerulus. And um, as you know, there are various diseases that can affect this part of the nephron, and I will be focusing on Alport syndrome as well as congenital nephrotic syndrome today. First, let's zoom in a little bit on the glomerulus. Glomerulus is this, uh, re this um, part of the nephron here, and if we zoom in, we can see that it presents a Bowman's capsule inside of which we'll have a capillary uh, or blood vessel that is coming in and twisting and then coming out. Um, on top of this capillary, we have these cells that are represented in blue here that are called podocytes. And podocytes present with a cell body as well as some little cell projections which resemble feet, uh, feet. And we actually call them foot processes. And this is an electron microscopy photograph where you can see um, podocyte cell bodies as well as the, these food processes. And if you cut through this, you're going to see a structure that looks like this, where you have the food processes here in blue on top. Uh, these are these little domes here. And between these food processes, we will find uh, these little bridges that are called slit diaphragm. And those are a uh, complex of proteins. And underneath the food processes, we're going to find the GBM. And I will be uh, using that term a lot today, GBM, which stands for glomerular basement membrane. And this is a mesh of proteins. And underneath the GBM, we're going to find vascular cells called endothelial cells that are here represented in red. And this entire structure is forming what we call the glomerular filtration barrier. And um, this is what is allowing your kidneys to filter the blood into the urine. Now, to study diseases of the glomerulus using our kidney organoids, we employ a number of laboratory techniques. And I'm going to talk you through a little bit um, uh, through these techniques. We have two options. We can either use the entire organoid, and in that case, we can do experiments such as immunofluorescence, this is using fluorescent antibodies to label protein. We can look at histology, that's using various stainings uh, to look at the structure. And we can do electron microscopy, as I have showed you before, uh, to look at very small details uh, in the structure. The other option is to dissociate these organoids. And we're lucky in the sense that glomeruli are uh, tight aggregates of cells and we are actually able to separate them from the other cells. And then we can recover what we call the flow through the remaining cells and do some experiments with them, uh, which Tom presented you, but I'm not going to focus on this today. I'm going to focus on the glomeruli um, that we can isolate through the sieve. And um, downstream application following this isolation include transcriptional profiling, uh, and as Tom explained, this is looking at gene expression, or we can also do quantitative proteomics, and this is looking at protein expression. We can also do continued culture, but this is not something I'm going to cover in today's uh, presentation. Now, let's focus a little bit more on glomeruli present in our kidney organoids. This is a picture you have seen before in Melissa and Tom's talk, and you know by now that in our kidney organoids, uh, here, the white structures that are labeled are glomeruli. If we zoom in using an electron microscope, we can see that these glomeruli present a nice Bowman's capsule. Um, and inside, we're going to find podocytes with, with cell bodies here. And we are also able to find primary and secondary food processes. 
As I mentioned in my previous slide, we can also isolate and separate these organoid glomeruli from the rest of the tissue. And you can see them here under a microscope. And once they are isolated, we call them org glons. Following this isolation, we can do experiments such as transcriptional profiling. And what you're looking at here is called a heat map. A heat map is showing the expression of genes and genes that are highly expressed will be shown in red and genes that are lowly expressed will be shown in blue here. And here is a list of genes that are important for podocyte maturation. And we looked at the expression of these genes in our org gloms compared to other models of podocytes used in laboratories. What you can see is that these genes are quite highly expressed in our org gloms. Then we looked at protein expression using fluorescent antibodies. And more specifically here, I'm showing you expression of nephrine, NEF1, and podocalyxin. And this is called DAPI. This is labeling the nuclei. What these proteins are important for podocyte maturation and function. And you can see that not only they are expressed in our oropelums, but they are also uh, showing the appropriate cell polarity. In other words, they are located where we expect them to be. Now, this is showing you that podocytes are maturing in our uh, org lungs. But we then looked at the GBM, which I mentioned earlier. To do that, we collaborated with, uh, uh, Lennon, with a Lennon lab, um, and uh, they did a matrisome analysis. That means taking all the proteins in the matrix, uh, so the scaffold um, of the glomerulus, and uh, look at uh, the proteins that are um, in there. I'd like to attract your attention here on the proteins that are present in these blue rectangles here. Those are constituents of a mature GBM. And if you look at this line here with the org gloms, you can see that most of them are present in, our, in the org gloms. Then we looked at where these um, proteins were uh, located and this is an immunostaining that is showing you here a 3D view where glomeruli are presented in white and capillaries or endothelial cells are labeled in red. And if you cut through one of these glomerulus, uh, you can see this kind of structure here where we have a Bowman's capsule that is labeled here in white with floating one. Inside of this, we can say podocytes that are labeled here in green, and right underneath these podocytes, we can see the GBM that is labeled here with laminin alpha-5. And we can also see endothelial cells that are um, around this glomerulus. Now, this brings me to an important uh, notion, which is when we decide which um, disease we want to model with, with our kidney organoids, uh, we need to better to know well our model, and that uh, resonates with something Melissa uh, mentioned before. Um, so I've shown you before some data demonstrating that we have maturing podocytes in our org lungs, and for that reason, we decided to model a podocyte disease, and uh, the one we chose was congenital nephritic syndrome. And um, I've also shown you that we have evidence of maturing GBM in our org lungs, and for that reason, we decided to uh, model Alport syndrome. So in the following slides, I will be focusing first on congenital nephritic syndrome and then follow on with Alport syndrome. Congenital nephritic syndrome is a disease that um, leads to high protein in the urine, low protein in the blood, and swelling. What happens in this disease is that the sleep diaphragm, which I've mentioned before, as well as the food processes, are actually disappearing. Um, and we call that food process effacement. And this uh, alteration of the glomerular filtration barrier is uh, responsible for the, the, the symptoms that we, we observe. What happens more specifically is that there are a number of genes which are known to cause congenital nephrotic syndrome. And one of the most frequently mutated gene uh, causing that disease is named podocin, which is uh, the gene on which I will be focusing today. When podocin uh, is not mutated, it is present at the membrane of podocytes, and in vivo, it, it is present at the slate diaphragm. And that is also true for nephrine. In a patient, what happens is 
the mutant podocin is actually going to get stuck inside the cell and will not go to the membrane, will not go to the slit diaphragm. And when I say that it gets stuck, it actually gets stuck along what we call the trafficking pathway. And tra you, what you need to know is that in a cell, there are different compartments and a protein will travel uh, to and from these compartments from the moment it is synthesized to the moment it goes where it should do its function. And um, the mutant will actually get stuck somewhere along that pathway. So how did we model this disease? We took fibroblasts, so skin cells, and we reprogrammed them into either control iPS stem cells, or we reprogrammed them and gene edited them to introduce a mutation of the podocin gene. And we actually created four different uh, producing mutations. And uh, each of these mutations is known to cause congenital nephrotic syndrome in a patient. And we then uh, generated kidney organoids and compared the control and the mutants. The first thing we looked at was producing protein, obviously. And it is here represented in red, while the blue here are the nuclei. And what you're looking at more specifically here are glomeruli. And what you can see is that while in the control we have an appropriate cell polarity uh, with an expression of dosin that is uh, at the membrane, when you look at the mutant, you can see that in most of them, the pattern is quite different. Here you have some dotted pattern, here you have more circles around the nuclei. And the reason why this looks different is because the protein is actually getting stuck the way we expected. So we were able to show that we can model different producing mutations using our kidney organoids. We're also able to show that the mutants get stuck along the trafficking pathway. And in the interest of time, I have not uh, shown this data, but we've actually shown in which specific compartment each mutant gets stuck. And now we're moving towards the screening of molecules to try and rescue the localization of the mutant. That means we're trying to find ways to push the mutants to go to the membrane, hoping that will um, rescue at least partially the function of the protein. Now, I would like to move on and talk about Alport syndrome. Obviously, as you all know, Alport syndrome it is a disease that affects the kidney, but it can also generate um, an infection of the hearing capacity as well as eyesight. It is accompanied by a range of symptoms, and these symptoms are due to a defect in this very important structure in the glomerular filtration barrier, which is the GBM. As you can see on this electron microscopy picture, the normal GBM looks like this, whereas the Alport syndrome GBM will present with severe splitting and thickening and breakage. The reason why this GBM is so damaged is because of a mutation in a very important constituent, which is type 4 collagen. Type 4 collagen is a quite complicated, a complex protein, and, it re and in the adult GBM, uh, the type 4 collagen that's present needs three different genes to be, um, to be synthesized, and Alport syndrome uh, mutates one of these genes. Now, how did we model Alport syndrome in our lab using kidney organoids? We had access to a family with a patient who presented a call for A5 mutation. And we generated stem cells from this patient and then kidney organoids, which we compared to control organoids. And the first thing we did was to look at the general patterning of these organoids. And if you look at this picture, you can see that they both developed quite well and that we had lots of glomeruli in both organoids. And what we did to compare these glomeruli was to isolate them uh, in control and patient organoids, and then um, perform transcriptional profiling as well as quantitative proteomics on these isolated glomeruli in collaboration with the Lennon lab. And we performed that three times to ensure data reliability. What I'm going to show you now is some results from the transcriptional profiling first. What you're looking at here is called an MDS plot, and to understand this plot, you need to know that two dots that are close to each other are very similar, whereas two dots that are separated are more different. And if you look at the patient, um, or Alport glomeruli here in red, and the control glomeruli here in blue, you can see that they are quite separated, suggesting that there are some differences between these 
um, control and output. Now to look at these differences, we actually interrogated the genes that were different between these two samples. And uh, this is called a volcano plot. And to read it, um, you need to know that on the left are genes um, for which the expression is decreasing, and on the right are genes for which the expression is increasing. And very interestingly, one of the first genes that popped to our eyes here in the decreased genes was called for A5, which turns out to be the gene that's mutated in this particular opal patient. And so we did a bit more digging around collagen type 4 in this analysis. And here, as what you're looking at here is gene expression in isolated glomeruli, whereas here at the bottom, you're looking at gene expression in entire organoids. Again, you can see a decrease of call for a 5 in the patient compared to the control in both. And interestingly, if you look at call for a 3 and 4, you can see that they are both increasing in the patient compared to the control. And uh, furthermore, we, as I mentioned before, we did some uh, proteomic, quantitative proteomics uh, in collaboration with the Lennon lab. And I'm showing you here one diagram that was generated by Louise Hopkinson. And uh, here in blue, you can see the proteins that are going down, whereas here in red, you can see the proteins that are going up in the old port glomerular line. Interestingly, again, we find our call for A5, which is going down in the patient, along with other very important GBM proteins. And if you look at proteins that are upregulated in the opal glomerular line, you can see that there are a range, there's a range of collagen genes, collagen proteins, as well as laminin proteins. So to summarize this data, we've shown that our organoids have a maturing GBM. We were also able to show the anticipated changes in call for a 5 um, which, were, which, was, um, which was validating our model. We also showed, uh, we were very happy to show some unexpected gene and protein changes between output patients and control. And what we are working on now is to try and understand the biological meaning of these changes in order to improve our understanding of output syndrome and um, hopefully to um, find some approaches for overcoming the injury. This is a picture of our lab, uh, and this is more specifically the team who um, carried out this work. Um, and I'd like to thank all of them and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to Aude. Um, uh, as an Allport patient, it's really exciting to hear about your collaborative effort with the Lennon Lab um, in Manchester and the progress that you're both making in understanding these changes in uh, proteins. Um, understanding the biology obviously helps us understand another part in the jigsaw puzzle about uh, what happens in uh, and causes Allport syndrome. Um, you, you briefly mentioned um, at the end your next stage uh, with the research on all sorts syn uh, syndrome. What, what additional questions are raised that you need to look at now? And do, does this lead us to new targets that might be useful for new therapies for patients? Or is that too far down the line? Well, the, the question that we are asking now is understand why these changes are occurring and, and uh, why so, such watch why genes are regulated the way they are regulated and we also want to um to do some um experiments that are going to validate this validate these findings and uh we also want to look a little bit more at some information which we cannot get from such big experiments which is the location of the proteins that are changing uh, now, whether that's going to lead to a treatment tomorrow, I don't think tomorrow, uh, but we need, as you, met, as you said in your question, actually, it's absolutely important to understand the biology around the all port uh, disease in order to then find potential targets. Excellent. Okay. I, I'm also keen or just to understand with you in Australia and Louise in Manchester as to the practical um, uh, ways that you've made collaboration work over the COVID uh, situation and lockdown. Who does w which bits and, and how do you work? It's really intriguing to understand more about it. 
Um, well, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with the Lennon Lab and with uh, Louise and Rachel more specifically. Um, how did we make that work with great efforts? Um, we, we generated the organoids and isolated the glomeruli here in Australia. Um, the transcriptional analysis was done here and we sent samples to Manchester earlier this year um, for them to do the proteomics analysis and they safely arrived. Uh, that was a tough night for us. We were a little bit stressed, but they safely arrived in Manchester and then they could process the samples there. Excellent, okay, so it's really, um, it's fabulous to hear about these collaborations. Um, so thank you very much. Right, Neil, I'll hand over to you to ask Aud some questions. Aud, thank you very much. I mean, you've just gone further really to show how beautiful these organoids are for investigating what's underlying some of these mutations. And, and you've taken further the question of testing out drugs that might help get over them and, and prove that in some real living structure that they make the, the effect you hope for. Um, can I ask you a little bit more about that Allport um, example you used, which many of our um, participants will be most interested in. I feel I need to little, know a little bit more about the mutation in order to understand the differences in expression level. And did I miss the bit where you told us that? Well, um, in that particular patient, there is a mutation that is causing the protein to be shorter. And there are some uh, process in the cell that detect when the mRNA, um, sorry, I'm using two specific terms. Um, it, the, the product of a gene expression is um, analyzed in a cell by very specific uh, cell mechanisms. And, um, and there are uh, systems in the cell that detect abnormal mRNA, um, abnormal gene expression, let's say. Yeah. And uh, one of them is, uh, it's called nonsense mediated decay. And so mRNA is uh, too yeah. short, we'll have uh, this, we can have this occurring. And that could explain why uh, call 4 a 5 which was mutated in this um, patient, was actually downregulated. Um, now, this is actually something we are investigating at the moment. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really interesting one. And I remember a comment at a, a previous session where one of these, um, one of the techniques to get uh, cells to skip uh, mutated stop codons is to give them drugs that read, read through them. But the best known drug is neomycin, which I don't think all port patients would like a lifetime on a drug known to cause deafness. <laughs> but I'm sure, there are, I'm sure there are going to be some uh, alternatives coming along for that, so, so that's good. Um, Christophoros is asking about um, endoplasmic reticulum stress in these mutations where there's a folding issue and there's, and there's a, a holdup. Yes, uh, totally. Well, uh, we have not yet in our organoid assessed endoplasmic reticulum stress, but I can tell you that some of these proteins are getting stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum and that uh, some of the compounds that we are uh, envisioning uh, to test to, to get these proteins out um, are actually uh, sh chemical chaperones and proteins that will, um, that will help both with the stress and with getting the protein out of the uh, endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum. I, I, I've wondered whether, um, well certainly some of the basement membrane proteins that we're talking about, but very possibly also some of these molecules in the podocyte are just produced at too low a level for endoplasmic reticulum stress to cause the cell a serious problem. I think the, um, the diseases where endoplasmic reticulum stress are a huge issue and killing the cells in an autosomal dominant fashion um, tend to be ones where the level of protein production is quite high. And I guess in kidney disease, the mutation is the UMOD mutation that causes um, an interstitial kidney disease. Um, does Muck1 do the same? I don't, I don't know. Tom will know. Yeah, great. Um, so huge, huge scope then for um, molecular therapies doing this sort of thing. This just sounds like such a fantastic 
system for 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 looking at them. Um, can, can I make a, can I make a comment there? Um, actually, these are expressed at quite high levels. Proteins such as uh, genes such as podocin and nephrin and the slit diaphragm proteins are actually made at quite high levels, uh, and it might seem more logical in some of those that are a refolding or a um, a rechaperoning process would be helpful, but I don't think that's impossible with the collagen defects. And in fact, in some collagen, other collagen disorders that aren't specifically kidney disorders, refolding is is an approach that's being tried. So yeah. I definitely, think you, it's you possible. Probably, you probably only need very small amounts of protein. So anything you can do to increase the amount that's uh, of, of sort of useful protein that comes out must be a a good thing, whether or not there is endoplasmic particulum stress, I guess. I think we, I mean, this, this, the work we've been doing with Rachel is still very much ongoing and, and it did get held up by the pandemic this year. Um, but, you know, we're starting to see some changes in some other collagens that um, might be trying to um, replace uh, what's not being produced normally. And so just understanding that process, what is the cell doing in response to this yeah. problem uh, is quite, I think is going to be quite important. So Louise Hopkinson has, has asked a great question actually, which is why did you choose this particular Alport mutation to study? Because we'd like really to understand the biology of all the different classes of mutation I expect. Um, well, um, this particular mutation was um, available here uh, at RCH. Um, and um, I have to say that this was generated uh, when I joined the lab. Uh, Melissa, if you wanted yeah, to... I have to actually help Aud out here because she started this at the beginning of the year. It really was an available family that we had already generated lines from and so we decided to start there. Um, there is always a balance uh, when you're starting out a new disease to ask, do I make lots and lots of different patients or do I first really establish that I've got a good model of the disease? And, and we opted for that. Uh, in the case of the podocin, we didn't make any patient lines. We just gene edited a lot of mutations. So there's different approaches. Uh, we would definitely want to do many more um, or put models and not rely on this one, but uh, we really take, this is the first occasion actually where we're comparing directly the, the changes in the model at the level of gene as well as protein. Um, because in fact, they don't always agree uh, and we can learn a lot more um, if we know the protein changes and not just the gene changes. Exactly. And, and, and um, you know, I, I must con you know, confess, there's always a terrible tendency on the part of a questioner. They hear some, they hear some great data, which has taken someone five years of really hard work to generate, and they say, well, why didn't you do 25 years of really hard work to give me some more? <laughs> but, you know, there's great, great potential. Um, I'm yes, and back. actually, been to, a to build up what you yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. I was just saying that to build on what Melissa said, uh, it would be absolutely interesting to look at, uh, to look if the changes we observe in this uh, pa specific patient with this specific mutation uh, actually apply to other mutation causing all port. Absolutely. There are some differences. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you all very much indeed. Excellent. Um, thank you, Neil, for your scientific questions. Um, you have a wonderful ability to ask them in a way that us patients can understand the threads too. So thank you for that. Well, a big thank you to our speakers today for their intriguing talks, um, illustrated, I have to say, with some stunning graphics. Um, it makes it so much easier for us patients to understand the science uh, with the colour coding, um, et cetera. So thank you very much, Melissa, Tom and Aud. Uh, we had an Allport patient who emailed Allport UK about four years ago, asking how long it would take researchers to make kidney organs from stem cells. And having met Melissa um, uh, 
uh, three years ago. It's so exciting to see the incredible progress, even in three years, that, that you're making in Australia. Um, congrats, congratulations, too, to Ord for collaborating with the team in Manchester, particularly uh, Louise in the Lennon Lab. Um, the Allport community really um, very much welcomes this kind of collaborative effort. Um, it's so exciting to see people working together to accelerate the progress um, in understanding the biology, um, which will have such an important uh, effect on the outcomes for patients. So we thank Melissa particularly and Professor Rachel Lennon in Manchester for making that collaborative idea work. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming today. What a great start to the online presentations after the summer break. We hope to continue our regular schedule into the autumn. And let us know if you have any topics or research, uh, or if there are any speakers willing to present, uh, and we would like to feature. Thank you very much, particularly to Melissa, Tom and Ord for sharing their inspiring research with us. It's a real privilege to have this relationship uh, with cutting edge science. Thanks to Neil for asking lots of important questions. And finally, a massive thank you to Kidney Research UK uh, for your very generous sponsorship um, over the pandemic and helping fund our Zoom subscription and keeping the lights on for these Allport online workshops. Before you go, some information on our next workshop, which is on Wednesday, the 30th of September. We have a webinar uh, back at the time of 17.30, British summer time. So that's 5.30 in the afternoon, a British summer time on new treatments and clinical trials. A number of pharma companies have kept working through lockdown and have been in, uh, in touch with the Allport communities. And we shall very much look forward to our presenters, Professor Michelle Rowe and Rachel Lennon, updating us with an overview of the exciting progress and what clinical trials are happening in which countries. If you have any more feedback about this session or want to be added to our mailing list, uh, please email us. I um, think, Archie, uh, if we can put this uh, in chat for people, research at allport.info. That's research at allport.info. Please also follow us on social media to hear updates about our workshops as they happen and details about upcoming research and, uh, well, we hope one day in-person workshops may be able to resume. Uh, patients can join the Allport Warriors Facebook group and anyone can hit us up on our Twitter page. That's at Allport UK. For those of us, uh, sorry, for those of you that would like a recording of this talk, we'll be popping it onto YouTube and Facebook and our Facebook pages later this week. Otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of the evening or day, wherever you are dialing in from. Thank you very much and goodbye. And panelists, please stay on the line. <laughs>